I want what all men want. The destruction of anime! Mankind's original sin! It's been a hot minute since I've done an RPG. Let's fix that with a classic 32-bit RPG I've been meaning to finish for a long time. And of course, I picked the worst version for this. Trying to play the most commercially accessible versions of games whenever I can has its downsides. Now, Grandia HD isn't broken in any serious way. I never encountered major bugs or crashes of any sort. No, my problem is the absolute hatchet job that Sickhead Games did to the sprites. They didn't make an HD remaster of Grandia, so much as they stuck a disgusting filter over the sprites to make them look smoother, making characters and enemies look blurry and smeared. Your mileage may vary, but I hate filters like this and turn them off the moment I'm given the option. There is no such option in Grandia HD. To make things more annoying to me, they base this off of the PS1 port and not the visually superior Saturn version. And despite claiming that they were quote, using the Saturn version as a reference point, working to match details and effects from that version of the game, Sickhead couldn't be bothered to add the simplest of those details, like having the buildings cast shadows like they can on the Saturn. They charged $20 for this on Steam. 40 in a bundle with Grandia 2 on the Switch. Grandia deserved better than a half-assed remaster like this. I'm morbidly curious what they did to Grandia 2 now. But since I own the Anniversary Edition on GOG and not Steam, the publisher Gunho just had the game delisted instead of giving me the new version for free like they did for Steam users. Fuck you for that, by the way. With that out of the way, let's talk Grandia. Originally released in December 1997 for the Saturn, exclusively in Japan, before receiving a PS1 port which would see the light of day in the West, Grandia was developed by the same company responsible for the Lunar series, Game Arts. In fact, they even share the same creator, the late Takeshi Miyagi. I would use this opportunity to compare Grandia and Lunar, but I've never actually played Lunar. I don't know how I've never actually gotten around to it. Hell, I own the Saturn version of Silver Star Story and still have never played more than a tiny bit to make sure my copy worked. I also can't read or speak Japanese, but that's what fan patches are for. I'm going off topic again, aren't I? It's easy to forget with the sheer amount of anime-esque RPGs on the market today, but Game Arts were one of the first developers to really nail the aesthetic of a playable anime series without actually being based on an existing anime. And Grandia is a shining example of that. Though the cutscenes are grainy and the CG is obviously dated as all hell, I can't help but admire the fluidity of the 2D animation and the solid work done in properly blending two-dimensional drawings with so many 3D assets. This is something modern anime has trouble with. Think about how painstaking the work must have been to achieve this effect in 1997. Grandia stars Justin, a young boy from the port town of Parm who dreams of journeying across the sea to the new world in order to become a great adventurer like his late father. A dead father? Nobody tell Christian Cage. But your father's dead. One thing you'll notice very early on is the laid-back pace of Grandia. There's a good amount of dialogue and wacky hijinks before you so much as see your first monster. Puffy doesn't count. I think. Some might find this to be unbearably slow at the start as you wander around on a scavenger hunt to find the four random objects, or treasures, that the local bully has hidden across town. Then chat over dinner with Justin's mom and his surrogate little sister Sue, then talk with the curator of the local museum about the myths surrounding the ancient Ikarians and their lost civilization, Angelo, before finally being able to leave town and get the plot going at this dig site. But I personally find it to be a nice way for the game to ease the player into its world. It's okay for an RPG to take its time before the plot really kicks into gear. If I wanted instant gratification, I would be playing an FPS, not a... Wait a minute. Those three look familiar. I'd make them go without rations for a hundred days. Oh, Mio, you're too kind. If it were me, I'd give him 5,000 lashes. 
Then I pickle him in brine and give him a hundred days in the brig. <laughs> that will kill him. Huh. Evil versions of Hikaru, Umi, and Fu from Magic Knight Ray Earth. Didn't expect that one. And yes, I'm playing with the awkward English dub instead of the original Japanese. Shut up! There's no treasure in all that junk! Call me weird, but I have a soft spot for wonky dubs like this where the English cast sound like they barely have any clue about the context of any given scene and have to wing it. It's not only endearing, but I find it helps me appreciate modern localizations more. <laughs> it's just like you to answer like that. Occasionally, you even wind up finding a few legitimately entertaining performances. Which is especially impressive when it comes to Grandia, seeing as how a good portion of this game's English cast have no other credits to their names on IMDb. Though then you have the performances that sound like someone involved in the production cast a relative who's never acted in their life. We've assigned an elite battalion of our forces to this excavation. Well, we're waiting. I'm sure that we'll hear good news. It's a good thing that Colonel Mullen isn't a major character. Alright. It's going to hurt every time he talks, isn't it? <laughs> well, let's get to work ourselves. Let's go, Lean. Just to hurt me a little bit more, let's check his Japanese voice. <sighs> That's the same guy who plays Oda Nobunaga in Samurai Warriors, isn't it? You bet your life! I've made a terrible mistake. Grandi is what I would describe as a cozy RPG. Its slower pace, cute and colorful character designs, absolutely stellar soundtrack. mostly light-hearted story make for a much more relaxing RPG than you'd normally find. Other great examples of this vibe are games like Popolo Croix, Paper Mario, and the Atelier series which I keep meaning to play more of. The remake of Atelier Marie seems like a good starting point. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy epic sagas that stretch across time, and dark tales which ask what can change the nature of a man as much as the next guy, but sometimes you want to sit back and relax as you play a 30 plus hour adventure particularly if it's going to be a grindy affair. And oh boy, does Grandia love its grinding. Well, back to the old grind. Grandia? More like Grindia. I'm sorry. Lame jokes aside, the grind is strong with Grandia. In addition to each character's base level, you have five other levels to build up to. These five being their weapon level and the four different elemental magics. What I wound up doing for most of the game was setting the auto battle to go wild so that my party would use every attack they had and then fight every enemy I ran into. Water magic is the one type that's easy, if time consuming, to boost. In many different dungeons you'll come across traps or hostile flora that will damage your party. Simply find one that's close to a save point, then let it hit you several times, cast healing spells until you run out of MP, then run over to the save point and select recover. Rinse and repeat until either your patience runs out, or you get access to each character's highest level water spell. Most of the time I don't bother too much with grinding, especially when I can't speed up the process. Really, did this remaster do anything at all that a basic emulator can't? I learned from personal experience that failing to grind everything enough in Grandia can be costly. I made it all the way to the Volcano Dragon the first time I played this several years back, only to give up in frustration because I didn't grind magic enough, and didn't make sure my party had levels in every weapon they could use. That's extra important since each weapon and magic level up also boosts the corresponding stat. I wasn't about to make the same mistake this time around. I made sure that almost every character in my party had access to all the spells and skills they could by the end. To make the grind more tolerable, battles are over pretty quick most of the time. It was rare for any random encounter to last longer than two or three full turns. I think that's the proper term for this at least. Grandia's battle system operates similar to Final Fantasy's active time battle system. Except, instead of a bar filling up, each character has a spot on this timeline, and once it reaches the action point, then they can act. Normal and critical attacks fire immediately after selection, but spells and skills have a wind-up time to them, unless you've maxed out the star rating on an individual skill. 
I cannot emphasize enough how much of a game breaker Justin becomes by the late game if you make sure to grind up his best skills. Not only do they do huge amounts of damage, but attacks like that can also briefly delay an enemy's action and create an opening for another party member. Another notable aspect of the battle system is how characters can move about freely in the combat area. In theory, this is a cool idea that opens up new strategic avenues not available in a typical RPG of this era. It's just too bad that the only way to move a character manually is to waste a turn by selecting Defend and then selecting Evasion. Now, characters will path themselves to an enemy if you select any kind of physical attack, so it's not as if they're stuck in place the whole battle if you don't waste a turn on Evasion. But the pathfinding can be absolutely terrible at times. Since your characters can't move through allies and you have no control over your party's formation at the start, your melee fighters can wind up stuck behind their squishier comrades as they spend their whole turn running in place. Behold! Behold! Don, gone it! It's not likely to cost you any battles, but it still can be very frustrating. Visually speaking, though the 3D environments have aged about as gracefully as you'd expect them to, not even the filter that the HD version ran the sprites through can hide Grandia's gorgeous sprite art. The cute, colorful, almost chibi-like designs of most of the cast are extremely well animated, providing a strong contrast to the progressively more monstrous and alien enemy designs. This is one of my favorite visual styles. I don't know what it is about it, but I love adorable heroes facing off against eldritch horrors. I blame Courage the Cowardly Dog. Unfortunately, the sprites do occasionally suffer from an issue in dialogue scenes where either the sprite wasn't layered correctly, or possibly was done to compensate for something that CRT TVs did, which LCD screens don't. And as much as I'd like to, I don't think I can blame Grandia HD for this one. I'm fairly sure I recall the PS1 Classics version doing the same thing on my Vita, and other footage I've found on YouTube seems to do the same thing. I'd play more of the Saturn version, which I wish I'd played to begin with, to see, but these problems don't start getting really noticeable until after you reach the end of the world. Never in my wastrel life did I think I would say this, but I don't have the time to play through about 10 hours of the same game again just to check a graphical hitch. So instead, let's talk about Grandia's awesome music. Grandia's score was done by Noriyuki Iwadare, a tremendously underrated composer responsible for similarly excellent work on both the Lunar Games, another reason I really need to play Silver Star Story already, as well as the Langrisser series. Fitting Grandia's themes of adventure and the wonder of exploring the unknown, Iwadare went for a soundtrack with a cheery, upbeat mood where even the battle music has this happy energy to it. Honestly, this may be one of my absolute favorite battle themes. Yet beneath the happy-go-lucky charm, there's an undercurrent of danger and a darkness that begins to creep in more and more as time goes on. Orchestral tracks become steadily more somber, while battle music and dungeon themes grow heavier as the true plot comes into view. In other words, it's exactly what you want from a soundtrack for an RPG with a lighter tone like Grandia. Overall, I would say Grandia's presentation is fantastic. There is, however, one notable flaw. The camera. In towns and early dungeons, you may not even notice any problems. But as you progress, the more apparent it becomes that the camera is pulled in too tight. Couple that with no map to consult, and it can make it hard to tell where you're going. If it weren't for this compass, which points towards the next exit, I would have gotten lost constantly. Game Art seems to have been aware of this being a potential issue, as there are these spots dotted throughout each map which give you a bird's eye view of the area. Not the whole map you're on, though, just a portion of it. I never found it very helpful. I kinda wish they would've just given me a map. Even an auto map that fills in as you explore would've been a million times more helpful. Just wait, it'll turn out that I did have a map the entire game, like how I could've skipped past the tutorials in Final Fantasy VIII by holding down the button instead of mashing it. I wouldn't be all that surprised, I do get tunnel vision when playing games. Alright, story time. Thankfully, this time I'm covering an RPG with a pretty straightforward first half, so I don't have to put up a spoiler warning immediately for once. Like I said earlier, Grandia's story gets going at this dig site, excavating ancient Ikarian ruins. 
The site is under the supervision of the Garlisle forces, a private army led by General Ball. Hmm. Shoulder cape, pointy pauldrons, weird eye patch monocle, ominous name, and possesses his own personal army. He seems like a swell fellow. But it's not the beneficent General Ball that Justin and Sue have to deal with when they arrive at the dig site, but the obnoxious trio of Nana, Saki, and Mio. If they're arguing over who can abuse their troops the most doesn't tip you off immediately to their personalities, then them throwing Justin's permit to explore the ruins down a hole will. Kobe! Okay, you're an asshole. They'll be the Garlisle Force's go-to jobbers throughout the story. That is their one dimension as characters. Wait, they also obsessively fangirl over Colonel Mullen. Two. They have two dimensions as characters. Hope you find it funny. I sure didn't. Their over-the-top sadism also seriously undermines how much effort the story puts into trying to convince you that Mullen and his right-hand simp, Lieutenant Lean, aren't all that bad. I'll get more into that later. Because the job squad here are three-thirds of a whole idiot, they don't bother to actually make sure Justin and Sue are kicked out. So our heroes do what all kids do, the exact opposite of what authority figures tell them to do, and go inside the ruins anyways. At the end of this first dungeon, they come across a door that the army have been unable to pry open themselves. Suddenly, the door resonates with a mysterious stone that Justin's father had left him, opening the way forward. Justin's father had always claimed that the stone was the Spirit Stone, an ancient magical artifact of the Ikarians. And this sure seems to be proof of that. Once inside, Justin and Sue encounter the hologram of a woman named Liette, who tells Justin that if he wants to learn more of the Spirit Stone, he must travel across the sea to the New World in search of the mystical city of knowledge, Alent. The quest to find Alent is the big story hook of the game, and the majority of Grandia is spent on the journey there. In a lot of ways, it feels like an RPG version of a road trip movie, with Justin and his steadily growing group of friends getting into misadventures on their way to Alent. Grandia's slower pace helps it out a lot here, as there are no high-stakes, save-the-world plotlines to make it feel like the heroes are wasting time. Yet. In addition, it features these nice scenes where you talk with your companions over dinner, and it really helps build up the dynamics within the party. After a brief detour to obtain a pass that will allow him to board a ship to the New World, Justin tries to do the responsible thing and leave the eight-year-old Sue behind for her own safety. But Sue is a stubborn one who isn't about to let Justin ditch her. This leads to the two of them being forced to work as sailors to keep the captain from throwing Sue the stowaway overboard. Here we have what I believe is the lone minigame in Grandia where you have to swab the deck within a set amount of time by balancing this power meter. Hold down the button for too long and you'll have to build your momentum back up from zero. Naturally, I am terrible at this. It's on this ship where you'll meet my favorite character in the game, Fina. Not only is she a total beast in combat with some of the best magic even before later developments, but Fina is simply a good character who starts off somewhat aloof and disillusioned with the adventurer lifestyle before rediscovering her love for adventure thanks to Justin's infectious optimism and steadily becomes the heart of the group. Really, the trio of Justin, Sue, and Fina have a fantastic chemistry that forms the heart of Disc 1's charm. From the point that Justin and Sue save Fina from being forced to marry the creepy doofus in charge of the Adventurer's Society, long story, the three are practically attached at the hip. Fina finally finds real friends who care about her, Sue gains an older sister figure, and Justin... Well, Justin is struggling to process these weird feelings he's starting to develop about Fina. Which is something else I should note about Grandia. It actually manages a slow burn romance that doesn't overshadow the rest of the plot or characters. Again, it's with these three in your party that I think the game has its strongest moments. After another dungeon delve, followed by a daring escape from the Garlisle Force's prison, where Justin is slightly aided by Lean, the only direction left to go is towards the end of the world. Not the apocalypse, mind you, this is a location literally known as the end of the world. Specifically, it's an enormous, seemingly impassable wall at the edge of the new world. No one knows what's on the other side, or if it's even possible to find out, but that's not going to stop Justin. First, though, our trio need to prove themselves to the beast people living in this village hidden in the mist. Resist the urge to make Naruto reference. From this point forward, you'll be seeing a lot more of these humanoids. I'm also assuming in the original Japanese, they're probably called demi-humans instead, since that's the usual go-to term for beast men in anime. Personally, I think demi-human sounds better, but then again, I also think that beast men sounds better than that. 
Regardless of what you want to call them, the test winds up being pointless as the army shows up not long after. Turns out that Lean helping Justin escape was all part of the plan to trick them into leading the army right to the Spirit Stone. The one they would have found on Justin himself back when he was captured, but Mullen is a Nepo baby who thinks bigger rock equals Spirit Stone. Crayons taste like purple! As well as that, Fina gets a nice case of whiplash upon learning that her sister is working for the bad guys, while Justin and Sue get to learn at that same moment that Fina and Lean are sisters. A revelation that is handled far less dramatically than you'd expect. Once the army is driven off with most of the village's sacred stone still intact, the party is off to climb the end of the world. And climb. And climb. And climb. I gotta hand it to Game Arts. I've made it past this point before, and I still wound up wondering if I'd ever reach the top of this damn wall. Because it wouldn't be a very good story if it stopped here, of course. The end of the world winds up being not much of an end at all. In fact, there's an entirely different land on the other side. This first area on the other side of the end of the world is one of the best from a visual standpoint. Having an almost prehistoric jungle be your first impression of the lost world, after the more temperate locales of the old and new world, instantly leaves an impression on the player and makes them curious what else could be waiting for them to explore. It really drives home the sense of free-spirited adventure that Grandia is going for. Also, Sue's missing. I probably should have led with that. It isn't long before a series of comedic misunderstandings lead to Justin believing this fellow here cooked and ate Sue. Now, at times Grandia has zigged where I thought it would zag, but I'm 99% sure that this game isn't going to go full Texas Chainsaw on me. I'm the Lord of the Harvest. Oh well, just need to knock this guy down to probably about half health before everything gets straightened out and... Oh. Oh, that's not good. Please don't break my butt. Okay. Truly? No. Come, power of the universe! Ha! Dragon King Slice! After sleeping off his latest concussion, Justin learns that the man who just swatted him away like a fly is actually a pretty swell dude who helped Sue out when the party got separated. His name is Gadwin, and he'll be the fourth member of the party with, wow, overleveled much? Well, if my Fire Emblem experience has taught me anything, it's that you never bother leveling a character with crazy high stats at recruitment. Allow us to introduce ourselves. It isn't long before the party is helping Gadwin save his hometown from the cursed rains coming from Typhoon Tower. Unfortunately, at the top of this tower are two doorways, one leading to what they need to stop the rains making Gadwin's village sick, and the other leading to certain doom. Being a true man of honor, Gadwin makes his sacrifice. Okay then, it's a good thing Justin has the devil's luck and a magic stone from ancient times to save his ass. With the day saved, it's back to questing for a Lent. Following some cute romantic tease moments for Justin and Fina, as well as much needed vengeance for me against this dragon, you run into the Garlisle forces again. This time at a site known as the Twin Towers. I'm not touching that joke with a 30 foot pole. Soon enough, a chance encounter with Mullen and Lean leads to the party getting separated, with Justin forced to work with Lean and Fina with Mullen in order to make it out of the tower. This is the point where the story initially starts to lose me, as it tries real hard to insist that Mullen and Lean are actually good people trying to do the right thing, but also refuse to explain what that right thing is. So all I'm hearing from Lean simping for Mullen is excuses. Clumsy antagonist writing like this kills a lot of narratives for me. If you're going to have an anti-villain, show me why I should think he's sympathetic. The nicest thing I can say about Mullen is that he seems more pragmatic than most of his underlings. But when these three are your direct lieutenants, it's not that hard to be the most pragmatic one in the room. With a lesser game, this probably would have been the point I call it quits and pick a different RPG to cover. However, the rest of Grandia impressed me enough outside of this moment that I was able to simply roll my eyes at all this so I could get back to the interesting part of the game. Case in point, Sue collapses from exhaustion. Turns out her little body can't keep up with the strain of this adventure anymore. There had been hints before that she hadn't been feeling well, but now Justin is forced to confront the fact that he'll have to leave his best friend behind. 
It's the first time he's faced with a conflict that he can't solve with plucky determination. To say nothing of the poor eight-year-old desperately trying to keep it together so that her friends wouldn't worry. This is made all the more heartrending when Justin opts to use his potential shortcut to Alent in order to send Sue back home to Parm. Without a shortcut, the party will have to take the long way across the sea to yet another land, or Justin and Fina will. Gadwin opts to stay behind to find his own path, offering his ship to his new friends as a parting gift. Another cute moment for Justin and Fina later, followed by one last dungeon that feels like massive filler, and it's finally on to disc two. As this is about the point where the tone shifts dramatically in Grandia, this seems like a good point to put up the spoiler warning. If you don't want any more of the plot spoiled for you, Skip ahead to here for my conclusion. Almost immediately after landing, you'll encounter Rap, an annoying little shit who soon becomes the first new party member on this disc. Now, I'm willing to give Rap the benefit of the doubt and assume that his weak dub voice plays a big part in it. <laughs> trying to act tough, fool? Don't you worry your little head. By the time they get back here, you'll be history. Cough, then fall over dead but I just could not stand him. Rap's decent enough in combat that I was able to tolerate him, but sure made me miss Sue and Gadwin even more than I already did. After taking Justin and Fina back to his home, you quickly learn that the Garlisle forces are here too and have set up a facility known to the locals as the Tower of Doom. Seriously, what is it with the obsession with towers in Grandia? Not everything needs to be a tower, you know? Anyways, this tower got its moniker for having caused Rap and his people's original village and the surrounding forest to be turned to stone. Our two heroes win Rap over by offering to go into the Tower of Doom, and he joins them on this mission. To everyone's surprise, someone else seems to have beaten them to attacking the Tower of Doom, judging by all the debris strewn about everywhere. The person in question is soon revealed to be Milda, who instantly made me like her by sending Rap flying. One boss fight later and the misunderstanding between her and the party is settled, with Milda deciding to join up. Okay, between her and Justin, I've got my heavy hitters and... She's several levels above everyone else. This is another Gadwin situation, isn't it? Can I have the slightest amount of stability to my party so I can stop feeling like I'm wasting time leveling them up? At this point, I wouldn't be shocked if even Fina left the party for an extended period. Back on topic, here's where we find out what the Garlisle forces have been working on all this time. Harnessing the power of Gaia, the evil being that nearly destroyed the world and caused the downfall of the Angelo civilization. Working for world peace, huh? Well, I suppose if it ever fell into the wrong hands, it could be modified and used as a weapon after a fashion. But that's true of almost any technology. I'm not kidding either. He genuinely thinks that this will somehow achieve world peace simply because that's what Ball said he plans to use it for. Remind me again why I'm supposed to have any sympathy for Mullen? Stealing the seed that they've been using to regrow Gaia doesn't help too much, as the army does what all Seekers of World Peace do in a delicate situation. Scorched Earth tactics. What? It's not as if they could have had Lean sneak in while everyone was sleeping. What do you think the Garlisle forces are? Some kind of elite military? Lean reveals herself to be a Nakarian as she teleports the seed away in a flash of light. Proving my point that this whole thing could have been done with zero damage to the village that was an accessory at best to the theft of the Gaia Seed. So when do we get the reveal that Fina is an Akarian too? Really? Why drag it out that long? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Even if the move list didn't spoil that she has spells with mysterious unlock requirements, these two are twins. Pretty sure it's impossible for twins to be of different species. For now, at least, it's back to trying to find a Lent after a lengthy amount of padding on the way to Milda's home, of course. Featuring one of the only bonus dungeons I've ever bothered finishing in any game. And I did it by the skin of my teeth. Look, we don't have much longer before Grandia goes off the rails for me, let me have my small victories. Once at Milda's hometown of Lane, in addition to learning that her species of humanoids have an extreme case of sexual dimorphism, you at long last find someone who can direct the party to a Lent, provided you can retrieve his missing horn. Apparently, Lanian males store their brain power in their horns. Okay, weird time to bring back the wackier elements. Not that I wouldn't have preferred Grandia sticking to this tone, it's just a weird way to follow up from the growing sense of dread surrounding the army's plan with Gaia. It also leads to the last dungeon in the game I enjoyed. Formerly the location of Lane before they were forced to flee, this place has been twisted by Gaia's influence into a trippy region with alien geometries. It's a cool way to show, not tell, 
the player of the dangers posed to reality itself by Gaia if it were unleashed again. Afterwards, the now horny wise man, there had to be a better way to say that, tells the party that they will need the Medal of Knowledge hidden in the city of Zilpadon, which they pass through on the way to Lane. It's at this point that Milda opts to stay home like Gadwin did previously to open the spot for the next temporary party member, because this disc is just intent on pissing me off. Back in Zilpadon, you need the permission of the Moge Elder in order to pass into the ruins beneath the city. The Moge are a cute mascot, I mean bunny-like humanoid species inexplicably given bad Italian accents. Said Elder turns out to be Guido, a traveling merchant the party have run into before. Guido is also the aforementioned next temporary party member. He's with the party for such a short period of time that I don't even understand why they had him join at all. Which is a shame since mechanically, Guido is one of the most unique party members. While Sue had elements of a support character, she still had access to plenty of damage abilities. Guido, meanwhile, has no access to magic and instead primarily relies on buff and debuff skills to assist the rest of the party, mainly through steroid injections. I'm a pro wrestling fan, Guido. I know what's in those syringes you keep shoving in their asses. Like you'd expect, you run into the Garlisle forces down in the ruins, and fucking finally, General Ball shows up to do something. Specifically, using Lean's loosely defined Ikarian powers to cave in the whole area to stop Justin and company from escaping with the medallion. Continuing Justin's streak of insane luck, Fina's own Ikarian powers trigger in time to save the two of them. Rap and Guido fell a bit earlier, but I couldn't possibly be lucky enough to be rid of Rap, so I'm not even getting my hopes up. However, the two of them are separated, with Fina being captured by Ball. At this point, I wouldn't be shocked if even Fina left the party for an extended period. I f***ing called it! At the same time this is happening, the one neuron in Mullen's brain finally fires as he realizes that his father didn't care in the slightest about the friendly casualties that would result from his action, and begins questioning his father's obsession with Gaia. The last horse finally crosses the finish line. Before we get to the fight with Ball, I'd like to note how much fun his voice actor is clearly having once Ball stops bothering to hide how batshit insane he is. Whoa! Justin! <laughs> Finally, I have the absolute power of Angelo in my very own hands. Die, worms! Together with this burning ship! <laughs> Man, we could have had this guy as the recurring threat throughout the game instead of his dumbass son. What a waste. Well anyways, here we have the perfect example of what I was talking about with how much of a monster you can build Justin into with enough grinding. This is supposed to be a somewhat tough one-on-one -on -one fight with Ball after Justin is separated from Rap and Guido in almost the exact same way as last time. I'm beginning to think that Game Arts had to rush Disc 2 in order to get Grandia out on time. Without any extra attackers to help stifle Ball's action meter, you should have to worry about the number of attacks he can hit Justin with. Unless, of course, you've maxed out his strongest attack skills. Yeah! We won, guys! But of course, that's not the end of it, and we see just how much Guy has been secretly mutating this maniac. In a classic villain move, Ball takes the opportunity to send Justin plummeting to his doom as he forces Fina to watch. What he and the writers forgot until this moment, though, is that Fina is pretty damn powerful herself, breaking her bonds and diving after Justin. Wait, why didn't you do that earlier, Fina? Like, say, before Justin gave Ball the Spirit Stone prior to the boss fight in order to try and get him to hand you over. Alright, oh, because then the rest of the plot couldn't happen. God knows we needed another tired save the world plot in an RPG that was already excelling at doing its own thing. Just power through it, Mike. Disc 1 was so good. There has to be some of that left here. I mean, Ball gloating about his victory and cackling like a madman as his airship goes up in a huge ball of flames as it crashes into the ground was fun. Maybe this will be the point he takes center stage and Mullen, Lean, and the Idiot Trio finally get sidelined. Or everyone just assumes he's dead, make no attempt to check or retrieve the spirit stone, and head straight to a lent. Okay, cool, whatever. I'm gonna save myself the headache and just start assuming everyone turned into idiots between discs. So, the reason nobody has been able to find a lent is because the Ikarians flung it into orbit to preserve some aspect of Angelo. Here, Justin, Fina, and Rap, Guido pieced out right before reaching a lent, at long last meet the real Liette, a forever reincarnating final remnant of a long-dead civilization 
forced to live a lonely existence of observing the world from afar. A whole portion of Alent is now a graveyard of past Lietes, where the color of the headstone indicates the life they led, blue being sad lives and red being happy ones. And nearly all of them are blue. Showing his trademark can-do spirit, Justin convinces Liette to leave Alent with them, promising to ensure her headstone is colored red. Powerful, powerful stuff. Too bad that's all of the plot that Liette will be mattering in for the rest of the game. Oh sure, she tags along the rest of the game, but you can take her out of every scene and change nothing about the finale. So glad I spent all that time invested in the Alent side of the story. Even worse, she's so underleveled that you have to do another few hours of grinding if you want to get her up to everyone else's speed. Look, I'm in the final act of this story. I am not going to grind up another character after all of that. To the surprise of nobody with a brain, Ball has succeeded in reviving Gaia and has kickstarted the apocalypse. I mean, Mullen tries to mutiny against his father, but it's Mullen. Of course he fails miserably. Well, whatever, the game's almost over. I just need to kick Ball's ass one more time and I can get this lackluster conclusion over with- Why is the game still going? Why are we trying to turn this into Evangelion all of a sudden? Okay, I'm gonna take disc one and put it right here in the happy corner. You, my friend, were excellent. A thoroughly enjoyable first half that made me push onward despite my misgivings. You are the entire reason I decided to still make this video and nothing I have to say afterwards has anything to do with you. This is single-handedly one of the most aggravating finales in any RPG I've ever played. It's all in the name of stretching out the game just that little bit longer. I'd really like to know how I keep managing to pick games to cover with endings that wear out their welcome. So after another boss fight with Ball, he completely merges with Gaia, unleashing it on the world. Mullen opts to try and use the same method that sealed Gaia away previously, like always, he's a fucking moron, because all this will do is stave off the end. Using this method requires two Ikarians to sacrifice their lives in order to provide enough magical energy. And there are only two Ikarians left in the world. That means when, not if, because his dad causing all of this is proof that it'll happen again. When this happens again, there will be zero way to stop Gaia. It's quickly shown that there might be another way when, while trying to protect Zil Padun from Gaia's onslaught, Fina unleashes a power far stronger than anything Lean can do. Convinced that there's another way to stop Gaia, Lean sacrifices herself to buy time for everyone to figure out what that way is. Instead of taking her words to heart, though, Mullen completely fucking ignores everything she said, and because Justin didn't say the exact right thing while Mullen was in the room, Fina goes along with him to kill herself for no fucking reason. Also, we can have a cheap, all is lost moment before Justin learns that the real Grandia was the friends we made along the way and oh my fucking god! You could have cut out almost all of this by simply cutting to the point that the spirits open the way to give Justin the sword that will pierce the heavens or whatever after Ball merges with Gaia. Apologies for the excessive fucks, but by the time I got to the actual final dungeon, I was seriously regretting saying to anyone that I was working on a Grandia video at all. I hated these last few hours that much. Every issue that I'd had up to this point coalesced into the central focus of the story, and I couldn't take it anymore. I finished Grandia out of obligation, not enjoyment. Lean's sacrifice is not only utterly pointless in that nobody she needed to listen actually listened to her, but also in that she's revived in the ending so she can go on to have her really gross happy ending with Mullen. And while 9 times out of 10, I would agree with the guy suggesting what seems like the only option they have left, considering all the insanely lucky shit that Justin has pulled off throughout the story. Maybe show some damn faith in him. If not Mullen the moron, then at least Fina should have the tiniest bit of faith. It all runs on bad melodrama because this is the point in an RPG where you have melodrama. Who cares if it fits the rest of the story, or if we have to make everyone into an idiot in order to do so? At any rate, Gaia, which is revealed to have been the corrupted whole of the original spirit stone that Justin's little pebble was only a piece of, is defeated and a new age begins across the world. Justin and Fina gallivant across the globe for a decade before returning to Parm with a whole litter of rugrats. Happy ending for everyone, roll credits. The first half of Grandia is so, 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 so good. 
and so, 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 so charming that it's almost heartbreaking for the game to close out on such a sour note. For as angry and exhausted as I felt upon finishing the game though, I can't bring myself to say that I dislike the entirety of Grandia. For roughly 25 hours, I thoroughly enjoyed my time with Grandia, and then grew to resent the five or so hours that followed. I can't in good conscience say that makes for a bad game. Just one with a big caveat I feel people should have an idea about going in. Grandia did what so few RPGs managed to do for me anymore, and provide a sense of wonder as Justin and his friends explored the world. It's through the charm of many of its characters, particularly the triangle of Justin, Sue, and Fina, that Grandia remains a game worth checking out in my opinion. So long as you know going in that most of the best content is stuffed into the first half, and prepare yourself for a slow slide down in quality afterwards. If you're interested in playing Grandia for yourself, unfortunately the only easily accessible option you have these days is the ugly ass HD version available on Switch and PC that's about as HD as using a couple filters on an emulator. But it is still functional, and is cheaper than shelling out $50 or so for a physical copy of the PS1 version off of eBay. That's it for this game. I'll see you next time. So what? So let's dance!